Hi, this is Larry Slagle with another executive session of Maslow Magazine. I'm here today with Jose Ibora, a well-known local Stark Countyan, born and raised in North Canton, but practicing law here in Maslin, Ohio, and throughout the really five-county area, don't you, Jose? Absolutely. Why well, don't you introduce Sometimes. yourself? Tell you, he's a lawyer. Where'd you go to law school? I'm Jose Ibora. I'm a local lawyer here in Maslin. I've had a practice. Uh, throughout the years in Tuscarawas County and primarily here in Stark County. Uh, went to law school in uh, Toledo. I was uh, born and raised here. My family uh, had a local uh, pizza business yeah. and worked my way through undergraduate school and ultimately law school. And, and you're fluent in Spanish, aren't you? Absolutely. Uh, I was blessed with having uh, grandparents that came from Spain. And actually, I, I learned Spanish before I learned English. I learned English. Uh, why I was in grade school. Okay, so um, a lot of people look at every person of Hispanic or Latino descent as being all Mexican, but they're not, are they? No, absolutely not. As a matter of fact, within the community that's changed considerably. We have uh, so many uh, different cultural representations. And you represent many of these people, whether they be uh, Latinos or Hispanic or um, from Mexico, Spain, Guatemala, Honduras, so, uh, what's your experience been within there, just representing them generally, what type of folks they are, how they get here, what they're faced with? Well, like in any, uh, I suppose, segment, there's, there's uh, you know, the, the great majority of them, which uh, can be summarized in, in a particular uh, very positive light, and like every segment of society, there are some that, the, you know, uh, are, are charged with more concerning type mm -hmm. of crimes. Uh, so my experiences ran that gamut, but to state generally they're very uh, hardworking individuals that come here uh, attempting to make a better life for themselves, um, always trying to achieve the proper way of doing that. And I've had many experiences where I've worked with people that I've known for over 15 years that come from families where they've gone through and plugged through the immigration process and have become themselves or become legal themselves and have families and have been established here doing everything legally for those periods of time. What kind of problems do they have getting either, uh, you know, they're called undocumented, other people call them illegal, but what problems do they have of becoming documented or even getting driver's licenses, for instance, to become um, part of the system and um, earn their wages as any other uh, worker in America would do? So first I would qualify by saying myself that I do not practice direct immigration law. Um, however, given the fact that I'm fluent in Spanish and have had so many of these Hispanic clients from different, uh, different cultural backgrounds, I've, hand, I've worked hand in hand with several immigration lawyers. Um, so just generally there's been a lot of changes, but I suppose to answer the question generally, my personal belief is, that, is there's just not enough access um, to what, what reflect. What do you mean by access? What I mean by access is that um, a lot of people, maybe the average Joe, doesn't know or understand the mechanism that's required for somebody to come in and then be what we re refer to as legal or documented. Um, so working with immigration lawyers, they try to shy away from labels because uh, an individual who maybe does not have status today uh, may qualify for status and that individual uh, after going through a process may end up being what we refer to as a legal resident. But when I mean access, it appears as though uh, because there are opportunities in this country that don't exist in other countries and the reality is that our labor market supports um, these type of, of jobs that these individuals are willing to perform, that there is a huge demand for them. But, for instance, by example, if you're a young man from Mexico, uh, to my understanding, the every country you come from with immigration has a different set of circumstances or rules or a different time, uh, time period in terms of how you may be granted uh, certain immigration status or okay. work authorizations. A young man from Mexico, for instance, my understanding is the wait period can be over 18 to 19 years. So it really, the immigration policies have created such an obstacle and the markets are here uh, that unfortunately you have people coming over in what the general 
average Joe would, would say is in illegal fashion. And you're talking about the wait period if they were to stay in Mexico and wait until they got the necessary um, document of papers to enter into the country could be that long. Correct. And Correct. what type of uh, um, employment do they obtain here uh, through the various uh, employers? Are, are some are major corporate employers. Do they have special procedures why, how, about how they go through hiring people that may not be as documented as an American coming in with their driver's license or birth certificate, for instance? I, I really can't speak directly to that. I can tell you that in my you know my practice, I have seen a variety of uh, different uh, backgrounds and, and different employment areas. A lot of them are working um, in industry. A lot of them are working uh, in services. Um, a lot of them uh, can be even migrant workers. Uh, so I've had an experience. I've had uh, other experiences with. Uh, immigrant workers that come over and they are in management and become part of corporate structure. Um, and we're talking about individuals that may have come here with a questionable status, but because of their background, their education, and their, their uh, bilingual skills, have actually progressed through a particular company, have straightened out their immigration status, and um, you know are, are very successful. And the people you represent, do they obtain some sort of a document to show where they live? Whether it be a driver's license or, any, or uh, anything like that. Well, again, there's there's all types of different examples, but one of the areas that has changed here, even within Ohio, significantly. Mm -hmm. When I first started my practice in 1995, um, in Ohio, an individual from another country could present with two forms of authenticating identification from their own country, and you could go to Ohio BMV. You could present those uh, documents, you could actually test and become licensed in Ohio, um, and then you would be operating a motor vehicle legally. Um, unfortunately, the tragedy of 9-11 had a huge impact and effect upon um, our nation, and ultimately has trickled down and made changes. For instance, in Ohio, uh, the individuals at the licensing bureaus, uh, the individuals uh, that work at the BMV per se have become more of a gatekeeper's role. So the policies that have been implemented subsequent to 9-11 now require that if an individual comes, um, instead of just presenting forms of identification from their home country, they will actually have to show proof of being granted authorized status through um, the United States government. And what kind of problems does that create? Well, it creates enormous problems because, as we've said, there's many people that, that come here. Status is really one of these things that, that, that is not identifying of an individual for an entire time frame. So you can come here and adjust your status. So someone who, who quote unquote, the common Joe may say is not legal, um, can come here and begin the commencement of, of a process. And one day in the future, they may actually be what the common Joe would, would refer to as legal. The problem is that time in limbo and immigration uh, situations traditionally can linger for years. So what it's created is, um, I've even had personal experiences where I've had clients that back in the 90s came here, have been here um, filing taxes, um, doing the things that they need to do, to comply with government regulation, but because they're in that limbo status, they formerly had driver's licenses, and now they can't get them renewed because they don't have that document from the immigration service to say, well, this is my, my status at this time. So it, it's really created all, I believe, uh, additional problems. Um, and when you communicate, I think we've discussed this on occasion that uh, people always think that every his, um, his um, Spanish-driven language that you can communicate one-on-one -on -one with anyone that everyone thinks is speaking Spanish, but they're not, are they? No, no. Um, there are uh, various uh, forms of uh, differentiate, uh, different manners of speaking, let's say it that way. Um, and the Spanish that is spoken in Spain may differ significantly from the Spanish that's spoken in Mexico. Um, may differ significantly from the Spanish that, that is spoken in, in say, Guatemala. We also have um, 
within the community. Um, large populations of in, individuals that come from uh, indigenous portions of, of certain countries. So even the Spanish, which can differ greatly, it would be similar to, to saying that there's uh, different versions of, of English spoken maybe in Australia and England as, as the English that speak, uh, that's spoken here in, in America. And even sometimes amongst uh, different areas within the continental United States, we have different accents, different words uh, that are used in, in some portions of the country, if not. But we're talking about individuals that not only is there that change, but they have never been formally educated in the Spanish language. They speak dialects, and these dialects uh, are, are, they don't even, I can't understand any portion. <laughs> they don't relate to Spanish at all, the dialects. But you get them because one of the judges or someone else may have referred them to you as because you should be able to communicate with them. Correct. My personal experience has been a lot of these individuals that come from those areas, mm -hmm. um, when, they, when they arrive in the United States, they begin an exposure to Spanish and they attempt to learn Spanish. Um, so their understanding of the Spanish language is very, very limited. It would be similar to saying, you know, many of them have maybe a, a very elementary level of, of education. Uh, in, in the Spanish language. And when you deal with them too, is there that other issue that many of them come from a society in which there are different rules, different laws, perhaps they don't have the education that a person that would be here and growing up in the United States, despite maybe one of the worst education markets they may have come from, they still had an education. So isn't there a difference there as well that they're coming from a different society their education levels may be different, and the like? Significant. Yeah. And it uh, plays upon uh, my practice on a, almost on a daily basis. Um, there's been a, a, a strong progression in Ohio, and our Ohio Supreme Court has tried to implement, as long with different rules that are, are now being, you know, um, I guess formulated throughout all the states for the use of language, foreign language interpreters in courts. Um, and, and it's a move in the right direction. The problem with that is that mm -hmm. uh, if you're dealing with an individual client who has a very limited understanding of uh, education from their home country, and all you're doing is translating the technical term for, for instance, um, the term of a jury trial or the term of, uh, of uh, grand jury review, uh, those are concepts that they don't understand mm -hmm. in their own language because they just don't have that type of an education. So it's uh, imperative to try to explain those processes to them in a manner in which they might understand them. And a lot of people think when they look at um, a Hispanic or a um, Latino as they walk down the street that they're a danger. But, you know, I've seen, obviously I've seen literally hundreds of your clients come through our doors here and I can't think of one circumstance in which I thought anything was occurring that was threatening or dangerous. They all seem to be just like any other person coming in here, except they may not have understood my hello as well. Isn't that, is that what you found too? I mean, if there's my no personal experience would be the same as relating uh, their cultural background or their, their nationality uh, to any other cultural background or nationality. Certainly there are some who have problems, like in anywhere, but the... Some the are bad hombres. Correct. <laughs> the strong, strong majority of them have uh, very similar traits. They tend to be very hard-working individuals. Uh, they tend to be individuals that cherish uh, certain core values of family. Um, I have had many clients uh, that will come forth and I explain uh, the potentials mm -hmm. for a case, not only uh, maybe a local case that they're dealing with, um, driving without a license, being in a situation where maybe uh, they've got caught up into the justice system, uh, not in a criminal nature, but in a nature that nonetheless presents uh, a formal case. And I've explained to them that, you know, because of this, there could be consequences outside from the federal government, the immigration sector. And a lot of them, well, most of them, whether, you know, honesty, uh, they, they all have the same core idea, which is, it's my obligation to complete or take care of my court problem and whatever may happen to me outside is in the hands of God. Um, mm -hmm. So my personal experience is, is quite, I mean, it's quite surprising um, because I can, I can almost say with other clients I've represented, 
um, if, if they're able to recognize there may be a greater uh, risk associated with completing a court case, um, they kind of disappear on you. That's not been my experience with the majority of Hispanics. There's a, such a strong number of them that will come forward and say, uh, whatever the outcome is, the outcome is, that's what, what God would want. So even though they may be here undocumented, or some would say illegally, they're still trying, other than that, they're still trying to comply with the um, social um, requirements of the environment in which they're living in. They're going to comply with coming to you to deal with the problem that's got brought them to you. They're paying their taxes for the most part if the employer is involved in that, but we know there are some employers that do not do pay in cash, but they they don't say I'm only paying my um, Hispanic clients in cash, they get, or workers in cash, they pay their American-born workers in cash too, because there are people like that, isn't that true? I don't get involved much in the employment side of things because mm -hmm. I'm not doing uh, immigration work, but yes, um, the reality is that my understanding for mm -hmm. most of them is that they are completing their taxes. Um, I don't do any of that work personally, but I aware from my involvement with the community that they will seek individuals to file taxes appropriately. The federal government has allowed, well, the IRS has allowed many of these individuals to file taxes under something uh, that's referred to the I-10 number, mm -hmm. um, which allows them to procure from the IRS an identification number and declare money that they've earned. Um, and my understanding is the IRS has taken the stance that we don't share that information federally. That's a confidential issue. So. Uh, the answer is yes. If they uh, find themselves in the justice system, I do find that the great percentage of them come forward, want to take care of that, make sure that they complete all their court orders, pay all their fines, pay all their court costs. Um, and not only that, but from my involvement with the community, they are completing um, you know, the other requirements, mm -hmm. filing for taxes and, and doing everything that they can to move towards um, gaining that status. So I guess in this short conversation we can say that just like most other things in America, there's a lot of complexity in it. There is nothing ever is totally black nor white. Uh, nobody's totally bad nor good. And most people are just trying to comply with the hand that's been dealt them as best they can. Absolutely. It's, 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 it's multi-layered and uh, my opinion is that the the unfairness is a lot of times individuals do not have, the average Joe individual, uh, do not really have a realistic view of a lot of these issues. Um, whether they be politically driven or motivated, uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Mm -hmm. um, but my personal experience has been that uh, you know it's a very positive uh, community to deal with and it's reminiscent of uh, the different immigrant communities that came here uh, years ago that established this country and make it great. Well, thank you, Jose. We've been talking to Jose Aboro, a local lawyer. How do we reach him? Oh, well, that's true. If someone needs to just talk to Jose about this or perhaps needs some help for someone that they think Jose would um, be good for that person, Jose, how could they reach you? Certainly. Uh, local telephone number, 330-832. 0800, and my offices are located at 2859 Aaronwood Avenue here in Maslin. Well, and Jose, I know, has dealt as much as any person I've seen with any number of people of Hispanic or um, Latin American origin, and he's done it very well. And I, again, I can only say that I have never, ever, in the 10 years that you, you and I have shared space together and these folks have been coming in or seeing any difference in them than anybody else that ever came in. So, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll, if you have any questions, give Jose a call. He is a fine lawyer. He also is a, has a great heart to represent these folks who need a, a lawyer, an advocate, a champion in their time of need. So this has been Larry Slagle with another executive session of Maslin Magazine, and I'll see you next time. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Jose.